the future. Good day, fellow travelers. This is Rich Gerald H. Bendel Smith. And welcome back to the second part of the life of Ghulam Ali, aka the Mysorean Missile Man. For those who are listening on this very moment, you have probably backed us on Kickstarter. Thank you very much for your contributions that help us bring this world to life. Know that all the money that we currently make on the series is going straight to our illustrators who helped us create our wonderful world and the very illustrations that you'll see in this here lecture. And without further ado, let's get started. At the end of our previous lecture, Ghulam Ali had left the Mysore Sultanate in 1789 to develop a rocket wonder weapon to blow the Limeys back to Britain. Therefore, he went to Paris to study rocketry. But there was a bit of a snag. This would be a whole new field of study that made him stand out among established academics who gave him the name the Mysorean Missile Man. Combined with his heavy accented French and foreign appearance, he didn't always get a fair chance to represent his ideas. Regardless, Ghulam's intentions to deliver the promised wonder weapon became inconsequential when, during the Fourth Anglo-Mysore War, on the 4th of May 1799, Ghulam Ali's uncle, Tipu Sultan, was killed defending his stronghold of Serampatam at the hands of the British and his native rivals. When news of Tipu Sultan's death reached England, the people celebrated, viewing the Tiger of Mysore as the face of fanatical Muslim rulers preying on those under British protection. Tipper Sultan wasn't just an ally with a glorious reputation. He was a bit of a francophile, and relations had been tight. In 1788, Mysore had an embassy in Paris. This automaton, Tipu's Tiger, came out of a collaboration between a French engineer and local artisans. The Mysore court even had a secret group of French mercenaries, something that went against the treaties with the Brits. When the French monarchy fell in 1792, this caused a bit of embarrassment. After all, how do you explain to a foreign sultan you have adopted an ideology that disposes of monarchs? So they kept this a secret until 1797. Officially, at least. However, there's an alternate version of events. You see, there is a story that Tipu Sultan in collaboration with a French agent called François Ripaud, founded an Asian branch of the Jacobin Club. Yes, the French Revolutionary Party that cut their own king short. According to these accounts, Tipu would have adopted the title of Citizen Sultan, planted a tree of liberty in his capital, and launched 500 Mysore rockets to celebrate its founding. It was even claimed this club vowed to destroy all monarchs, except Tipper Sultan, of course. Is there any truth to this club? We don't really know. Many will claim this was a clever piece of propaganda, spread by the British East India Company as a casus belli for the invasion of Mysore in 1797. This would be a legitimate reason for the British populace who had been growing tired of the company's questionable ethics. These rumors even persist now, giving Tipu Sultan an ambivalent legacy. To some groups of Indians, he's a freedom fighter and innovator who preached religious tolerance. To others, he was a tyrant who destroyed temples and churches and forcibly converted people to Islam under threat of torture and murder. And then there was the infamous massacre of an estimated 800 to 1200 people in Mandayam. Not a good look, but that will be for history to decide. At that time in Paris, Ghulam Ali was 24 when he received news of his uncle's death. However, by the time it became apparent that his focus had shifted entirely to reaching Elysium. Although he mourned the restoration of the Wadayar dynasty, he would never return to Mysore. At the beginning of his academic pursuits, Ghulam was considered to be an eccentric, a man with grand ideas with little to show for them. 
After all, he hailed from Mysore, a place not associated with grand feats of scientific breakthroughs. He soon realized that the academic world wasn't prepared for genuine scientific progress, and he took his rocket prototypes to the public arena. Although, the fact he lost his source of wealth might also have something to do with it. To fund and promote his endeavors, Ghulam created elaborate firework displays with rockets that reached higher and exploded more spectacularly than the others. He even made some money on the side by patenting his pyrotechnic marvels and writing manuals. Above all, he also gathered more rocket enthusiasts among esoteric groups fascinated with Elysium. These enthusiasts eventually formed a club called the Babylon Society, dedicated to rocketry under Ghulam's influence. They helped fund his more ambitious experiments, but soon his ambitions outgrew the means and intentions of these hobbyists, who were unwilling to take the risks necessary for genuine progress. The feeling became mutual when the society launched one of its most ambitious rockets yet. It exceeded expectations, but struck a farmhouse. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Except for the family's dog, Woof. Sorry, Woof. To avoid public embarrassment, Gulam Ali was dismissed from the society. This setback didn't bother him for long, however, as he received an invitation he couldn't refuse. You see, in 1804, Napoleon Bonaparte became emperor and he spared no expense to celebrate this milestone. In 1804, Napoleon Bonaparte was at the pinnacle of his power. He had defeated numerous great nations and won campaigns all across Europe, cementing the French nation as a formidable force on the world stage. Under his leadership, he introduced the metric system and famously mandated driving on the right-hand side of the road, a move seen by some as a way to annoy the British. Napoleon was celebrated as a man of the people who restored order after the chaos of the French Revolution. However, his reign also had a dark side. Apart from terminating his opposition through means of a secret police force, Napoleon made civil registration mandatory and instituted a draft of all eligible men. He also implemented the continental system, which aimed to isolate England from the European continent economically. To those who had experience with his campaigns firsthand, Napoleon was viewed as a power-mad dictator. They accused him of committing numerous war crimes and atrocities, particularly during his campaign in Egypt and Syria, just for the hell of it. Furthermore, his abrupt departure from Egypt, thus leaving his armies behind, was seen as a betrayal by many. However, Napoleon and his supporters had worked diligently to suppress negative news and portray him in a positive light. Thus, the French populace remained largely unaware of the events in Egypt, assuming that he had successfully concluded the campaign. When Bonaparte crowned himself emperor in 1804, Ghulam Ali was commissioned to showcase his fireworks display over Notre Dame Cathedral. On a nearly unlimited budget, Ghulam created a grand display that left the populace in awe, ultimately earning him a personal audience with the emperor himself. The details of their meeting remain a mystery, but we know it marked the beginning of Ghulam Ali's rise to prominence, as he was assigned as a lead engineer at the brand new Académie d'Aéronautique in Paris. Ghulam Ali's journey took an intriguing turn when he began working in that institution, characterized by a futuristic architecture, bringing together scientists from around the globe to achieve the improbable, exploring manned flight and advancing humanity's quest for the stars. While prestigious, the academy was viewed with suspicion by the military community due to its secretive nature. Although it didn't claim to exclusively focus on civilian projects, an air of obfuscation surrounded the institution. During his tenure, Ghulam Ali rarely made public appearances beyond lecturing about his rockets. 
Before long, British and Prussian agents raised concerns about French covert activities, but Napoleon's chief of police, Joseph Fouché, effectively shielded the academy from interference. Thus, they couldn't prevent what happened next. On March 8, 1809, the people of Dover were awakened by a massive explosion near the city's outskirts. When they investigated the affected area, they found the remains of a thin rocket sticking out of the ruins. Napoleon declared that he would continue launching his so-called vengeance rockets for the duration of the war as long the British refused to surrender. Over the next five years, Napoleon launched these rockets at civilian cities between Dover and London in an attempt to break the English spirit. While the roaring of the incoming vengeance rockets was disheartening, it strengthened the British resolve, leading to a surge in army recruitment. During the War of the Sixth Coalition, Napoleon faced defeat near Leipzig, prompting his retreat to France. With victory within their grasp, the members of the coalition looked to the future. With Napoleon removed from the playing field, a new balance of power had to be established. One that would be based on the ability to construct rockets or not. And so, the Académie d'Aeronautique became a priority target for each individual member. Unfortunately for them, by the time the Prussian forces entered Paris in 1814, the academy was aflame. Upon investigation, it turned out that Ghulam Ali and many other scientists were missing, leaving their fate shrouded in mystery. The coalition forces never publicly disclosed what or who was recovered from the smoldering ruins. However, during the investigations of arsenals and Napoleon's private collection, inspectors discovered unsettling artifacts, including items from Egypt and Syria of unspecified origins. Eyewitnesses reported shipments being taken away from the academy before the fire broke out, sparking rumors of technologies influenced by lost civilizations being hidden in the French countryside. Terrified of their allies recovering these artifacts before they would, the involved parties initiated their own investigations without sharing intelligence. This proved to be a costly mistake. In 1815, the ink on the Congress of Vienna's final act had barely dried when the Allies received word that the Emperor of France had returned from his exile on Elba. Against all odds, the French army embraced him back as their Emperor, forcing the coalition to declare war on Napoleon. Let me repeat that. They declared war on Napoleon. Not the state, but the man himself. Unsurprisingly, he refused to surrender, leading to the meat grinder known as the Battle of Waterloo. Now many books can be written on the Battle of Waterloo, and many more will. But these won't mention the reported sightings by soldiers of strange and destructive weapons on the battlefield, including mechanical soldiers fighting alongside the French army. However, despite these innovations, Napoleon was eventually forced to surrender. This time he was exiled to the remote island of St. Helena, where he would die in isolation. Amidst all this upheaval, the fate of Ghulam Ali and his work remained a tantalizing enigma, casting a shadow over the legacy of the eccentric engineer amidst the backdrop of one of the most tumultuous periods in history. But then, in 1818, Ghulam re-emerged in New York, announcing the Babylon Project. A new independent space program, not affiliated with any government, located in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. 
This civilian enterprise promised investors that these rockets would enable them to tap into the wealth of the solar system. And they bought it. Thanks to corporate backing and Uttercrab's rising prominence due to their wireless radios called Wavecasters, Gulam's ambitions reached far and wide. And after all those wars and uncertainties, people were hyped for these developments. Overnight, this inconspicuous engineer had gained recognition as a visionary. Despite allegations of war crimes, many saw him as a pioneer paving the way to Elysium and beyond, particularly as the Commonwealth's reputation suffered due to colonial policies. And then, in 1822 the moment had arrived. The Comet rocket was prepared for launch. She was crewed by six volunteers tasked with surveying Elysium's surface to prepare for future landing parties. Representatives from governments and industrial giants gathered to witness this historic event, a testament to Western enterprise and the scientific method. Uther Crab played a significant role in broadcasting live, making the event accessible to people across the globe. They used the occasion to promote their new Wavecaster MK2, further solidifying their influence and wealth. On that fateful day, the count to the launch of the Comet 1 had begun. Entire neighborhoods gathered around their neighbors' Wavecasters, counting along as the Comet 1 was about to be propelled into the heavens. The people held their breath as the engines roared to life, expecting a miracle to happen. But instead, what transpired was the moment that shook the world. Hey, get out of the way, please. When the countdown reached zero, all that could be heard over the waves was the air-wrenching screech, followed by the screams of the crowd as the Comet 1 burned. The result of the comet disaster was traumatic, to say the least. In that instance, there was a collective dent in humanity's confidence. This, among with the ensuing investigation, might have spelled the end of the Babylon project altogether, as no evidence of neglect could be provided, although suspicions of deliberate sabotage by a third party had been raised. There were no suspects. Regardless, Public confidence in Ghulam and his expensive passion dropped significantly. Despite these setbacks, in 1824 the Comet 2 was ready for launch. This time there was a lot less fanfare and no outsiders were allowed on the platform. And this time, the launch went off without a hitch. Radio stations around the world received word that the Comet 2 was on its way to Elysium. But as newscasters prepared to report this historical moment, they received a new message. To please curb their enthusiasm. For the most unlikely of events had transpired. The Comet 2, after leaving Earth's orbit, had vanished. Not exploded, but it had disappeared without a trace. And all the ground crew could do was look up at an empty sky, hoping it would reappear from some optical anomaly. But the Comet 2 was never seen or heard from again. The Comet 2 disappearance was an enigma that marked the project's final launch attempt. Ghulam Ali had spent every resource, called in every favor to make this launch happen, but the public and his sponsors had lost all confidence in the Mysorean Missile Man. Thus, Ghulam Ali lost his place in the spotlight, and the curtains were drawn on his Babylon project. He had become a laughingstock, and many of his supporters retracted their support to spare themselves the embarrassment. Ever since, he has been living as a recluse on the Babylon platform with his remaining servants, waiting and praying for some sponsor to breathe life into his ambitions. So far, none had come. Not until 1872, 
and without warning, a powerful figure knocked on his palace gates to deliver her demands, whatever those might be. If you want to know the conclusion, the story will be continued in Journey to Elysium, our new comic book series that is currently on Kickstarter. To everyone who backed us, thank you all so much. This project means a hell of a lot to me and I'm just overwhelmed by the amount of support it has gotten over the years. It's nowhere where I want it to be, but with your help, I'm sure I can make it happen and who knows. I think we're building something great here. And despite my limited reach, it's an adventure. A journey, as it were. And I hope you'll join me as we had for our own place among the stars. Thank you.